coming at you from the OLR Podcast Studio. Eh, it's really more of a basement. Coming to you from the OLR Basement Studio. But it's still a podcast. Coming to you from the Podcast Basement Studio. Yeah, but you still need to say OLR. Coming to you from the OLR Podcast Basement Studio. Oh, that's way too many words. Coming at you. That's not enough. You still need to say OLR. Let's just start. It's OLR. Welcome to the One Lane Road Podcast with Lucas and DK. I'm Lucas and this is DK. Hey guys, welcome to tonight's show, especially if we have new listeners uh, join us for the uh, for the topic here tonight. We're going to be joined by Sports Illustrated's Tim Rohan. Tim's been doing a nine-part podcast series on the uh, murder-suicide of Tennessee Titans legend Steve McNair. Um, Perpetrated by Sahel Kazemi is what the official narrative says. Um, his podcast is called Fall of a Titan. Yeah, that's right. It's a, like I said, nine part series. It's all wherever you get your. Um, of course, I listen to it on iTunes. It's so, on Stitcher. Uh, I'm sure it's on YouTube. So it's all over the place. Wherever you get your podcast, at. check it out for sure. It, it wrapped up. The last episode was was dropped today. Uh, yeah, yesterday actually. Uh, we're recording on a Thursday. So uh, we had um, another guy, another good key contributor, Vincent Hill. He was on several weeks back with us, kind of giving his um, his opinions on the case and why. He doesn't think it should have been open and closed within four days like it was here in Nashville. So um, I think it was really interesting and brought up some serious uh, questions worth looking into. And I just thought Tim and Vincent and everybody, you know, especially in particular those two guys, did a heck of a job covering it and opening up new questions. And hopefully, you know, this thing's reevaluated in a couple of years. Yeah, hopefully, you know, uh, Vincent, like you'll hear in the podcast, has been trying very hard to get it reopened. He's been in front of the – Supreme Court, I believe is how they how he phrased it uh, in Tennessee twice, trying to get it uh, back open, and um, just a real interesting story, you know. Probably, yeah. probably not as clean of a case as what people would like to like it to have been. So, yeah. so here's Tim. Uh, he gave us a good a good interview, about thirty minutes worth here, and we're gonna go ahead and play that for you right now. Hey guys, Lucas here. If you're enjoying the show, please make sure you're subscribed to it on whichever podcasting site you're using. Click like, leave us a rating, and a comment if you have a few minutes to spare. And don't forget, you can reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at OLR Podcast. All right, guys, tonight we're joined by Sports Illustrated's Tim Rohan, who uh, we've been plugging on the show here the last couple months for his um, narration of the podcast series, Fall of a Titan, about the uh, murder suicide of. Steve McNair, Tennessee Titan legend here in this state. So, uh, Tim's joining us tonight. How are you tonight, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. So, um, so when you were assigned this case in what you said, spring of 2017, what was your um, what was your overall um, knowledge of the case prior to that? Yeah. So uh, you know, it, it was it was uh, it was summer of 2017. My editor you know, approach me and just, uh, we have this tr- SI true crime series and, and we write about the intersection of crime and sports. And he, he quoted the name Steve McNair, you know, and I, I remembered McNair, obviously, uh, you know, he was one of the best quarterbacks of the late nineties, early two thousands. And, uh, and I knew he had died, but you know, I didn't know much of the details about his death. Um, but you know, once I started talking to people, Vincent Hill and, Dr. Alvin Simpson and other, you know, friends and family of Steve's and, and friends and family of Jenny Kazemi, you know, it, it became apparent pretty quickly that there were a lot of questions still out there and that there were a lot of people that just didn't accept the, the police's narrative of what happened. Hey, you know, he was, he's such a big figure here. Um, you know, it, it was, it was a huge story around not only Nashville, but Tennessee in general. So, you know, it was something that was, um, you know, probably a, a lot closer to, uh, our hearts than, you know, nationally, but yeah, you know, that being said, whenever you were given the story, was it because of, uh, you just cover the NFL or, or, you know, what's your background to where you would have, uh, been given that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, yeah, I cover the NFL. I've also done, a, you know, a few investigative stories and, and kind of, you know, deeper dive type stories, uh, before. So that's a little part of my background. Um, and so, yeah, it was just kind of uh, the marriage of, of those two ideas. Uh, let's get someone on the story to take a look at it. 
And I also think, you know, I don't know if this was a explicit thought, but, you know, it had been, at that point, it had been, um, you know, I guess about, uh, this has been eight years. Yeah, I guess eight years since Steve died. So it hadn't been, it wasn't approaching the 10 year anniversary, but, uh, you know, it had been a while, a little bit removed. So we thought, you know, also that there hadn't been a whole lot written about it. There'd been a few stories here and there, but nothing, I don't think to the, the depth that we went to in, in, in the, you know, reexamining it. Yeah, you definitely did a really nice job. And if anybody hadn't listened to the podcast, it's a fantastic listen. You know, it listens r- really quickly. Um, and I, I suggest listening to it, uh, you know, in, in one sitting if you can. That's kind of the way I did it. I waited for all of them to come out, and then I, uh, I just binge listened to all of them. That way I keep along with the story. Um, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of things that we want to get to uh, on this, and like, like we say, we know you, you don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, what was your reaction that you were getting during the investigation? Uh, you know, when pe- when you start asking questions of people, were they forthcoming with you? You know, we saw the reaction that kind of Nashville uh, Police Department gave you. But in general, how were people reacting to all the questions and bringing it back up nine years later? Yeah, um, you know, I think there were some people that were receptive just because, you know, they're the ones, you know, the people that had questions about the case you know, we're, we're happy to talk about it because, you know, they, they have questions and they want to get those questions out there to let people know that they think this is still unsettled and unresolved. Um, you know, there were some people, you know, the McNair family, uh, ended up not talking to me and, you know, Michelle McNair's his widow didn't talk to me. And, uh, there were times when Jenny's sister was, you know, a little hesitant to talk to me and it's a, for them, obviously, and you know, obviously for people in Nashville too that are close to the story, it's it's a sensitive subject. You know, it's, Steve died in in this you know uh, gruesome way, in this public way, and you know, and uh, you know, obviously, you know, it's a, this, he's a uh, father, a, a, a husband, a son, a friend. You know, they they knew him better than anyone, and you know, it. I, I you know, I heard from a lot of people just how much his death affected you know, his family and the people close to him. And so, you know, it's understandable that they, they, you know, they might not want to talk, but, um, you know, as, as you hear in the podcast, talking to friends of theirs or people that know the family that, you know, they clearly had questions in the aftermath of Steve's death about whether Jenny Kazami really did it. So it was kind of a, you know, it was a mixed bag. You know, I think there was certainly, you know, as you heard in the podcast, there was a lot of people that had questions that, and, you know, if they had questions, you know, they really didn't mind talking because, you know, that's, they wanted people to know, you know, that they're, that they feel that way. What about online as far as, you know, this has been pushed so heavily, you know, through your Twitter page and, and all over social media. What, what's been the kind of the backlash or the uh, reaction you've got from, from other listeners, from Twitter followers? Has it kind of been a, uh, also a, a mixed bag of emotions? Yeah. I, you know, I think some people, um, I don't know, they, they, they don't always tweet at me, but, you know, just generally what I've kind of seen or heard from, you know, talking to people in Nashville, uh, you know, it's, I think for Nashvillians, some people, it's hard to listen to this stuff, you know, go into this much detail about Steve's death, just because, like I said, of the way he died and he was found with another woman and, you know, people told the police about, you know, him having multiple girlfriends and him living this, this other life that the public didn't really know about. Uh, maybe as well as they found out after he died. Um, and so, you know, I think for a lot of people who had a vision of Steve, you know, he was, if he was your favorite player, if he was, you know, you, you might not want to think of him as, you know, this guy who was sleeping around, who, uh, you know, was probably the mistress and then was, you know, murdered in this way. And so, you know, obviously that's a sensitive subject for some people, you know, I, I could definitely imagine it'd be hard to listen to, but, you know, talking again, you know, the reason we bring up that stuff, the reason we have to go through all the, those details is because, you know, there, there might be clues as to what happened or, you know, they might, it's all context, especially for people who think that it's unresolved, right? That, mm. you know, any piece of, any piece of that could potentially be a clue, you know, to figuring out, uh, what happened, you know, inside that condo. I can kind of agree agree with you on that point. I follow a lot of different uh, Nashville sports media and and whatnot, and no nobody really um, the big market um, radio station stuff. They've touched on it on the radio, you know, here and there. But I follow 
lesser accounts, and they um, they kind of speak at it on a fan perspective because you're right. You know, nobody wants to look at their hero in such a light. You know, we want to remember McNair for the you know the antics on the field. You know, um, the the image of him not being able to be tackled in the Super Bowl that year and the MVP season and all that. So people, I guess, unless there was a new revelation in this show, were kind of reluct you know reluctant to listen because. You don't want all those feelings brought back nine years later. Um, so I've seen that reaction. But at the same time, listening week after week, and I'm unlike Lucas. You know, Lucas binge listened, and I was just waiting yeah. every Wednesday morning <laughs> trying to find <laughs> something new. Yeah. And so that was my you know ride to work every Wednesday morning was, was this podcast. And I guess, you know, how vital was Vincent Hill? Because what I've been seeing, especially in the last, well, really the whole time, your name's been pretty clear. Um, you've been pretty clear of too much criticism, but man, Vincent is just getting roasted. And he was a guest on our show, you know, a few weeks back, and he was a great, great guest for us. Um, he was a big, yeah. important part because when nobody else would talk to you, Vincent Hill did. So, um, what what can you give us on what Vincent contributed to this podcast? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it all started with Vincent. Um, I think he. I mean, he was he was one of the first people I I. I contacted as far as, you know, I just found, you know, this guy had questions about the case and, you know, I mean, people can, you know, I, again, I think we, we lay it out. I mean, Vincent's a complicated guy and a complicated character. I think people have questioned his motives, um, in, in reinvestigating the case, but I don't think you could deny that, you know, he spent, <laughs> he spent, He's passionate. you know, nine years, he spent nine years now reinvestigating this case. He's been pouring over stuff and re-interviewing people and whatever you say about whatever his, his motives, his, his police record, whatever the national police say about, you know, he never investigated a homicide. There's something to be said for someone who's poured and spent this much time looking into it. Um, yeah. Now, is he right on every last thing? Maybe not. Um, but there were things that we thought were valid enough to include on the podcast. And, you know, I think he, you know, he was one of our central characters that we were kind of following, right? You know, kind yeah. of just you followed his journey from, you know, right when they died to starting to look into this case, to getting hired by Lucille McNair, to taking his case to a uh, national grand jury and trying to get the case reopened. So, you know, I, Vincent was kind of, you know, obviously he was a central character of the podcast. And um, does that mean he's perfect? No, but I mean, that's, that's not the point, you know, and I, I you know, I guess people can, I, I haven't really seen, what people have been saying about him online, but, um, you know, he, he is, uh, he is what he is. Yeah. You know, and he's very passionate about it because even if, you know, if you were to question his motives and saying it was financial or, or, or otherwise, you know, at some point as unfruitful as the case has been for him and as many dead ends as he's chased down and any, as many closed doors as he's come up to, and he's kept going, um, you know, there, that financial motive is kind of gone. You know, because he's continued on and on and on and on. So, you know, that financial motive really doesn't make sense that I've seen, you know. So he's obviously just yeah, really well, passionate about the situation. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's passionate about it. I mean, yeah. and that was, I, you know, I thought that was the, you know, the perfect way to end, end the series. Yeah. You know, Vincent letting us know that he's working on a third book. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, I thought that was just the, you know, that was the note to end on, but, yeah. uh, no, I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I won't, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, those, I just, I just bring that stuff up because that's what people say, right. Those, I mean, that, they question his motives and, right. and, uh, you know, so, yeah. Um, I get the, I get all that. And like I said, some people are, are saying that he doesn't really, he takes tidbits here and there that support his narrative. And, and run wild with them, but they said when when it's opposite of that, he doesn't really talk that much about when it's something that doesn't support his narrative. But without his theories and everything else, there's all these questions that you have Gilliam and Gaddy and all these guys that stuff that didn't add up that he jumped on. I mean, it it really made for some interesting things because here in the last before this podcast came about, I've never once questioned, and I'm a, I'm a huge Steve McNair fan, obviously, but. I just I just accepted you know what it was a four day open and closed case that you know the girl killed Steve and then she took her own life. It's never been questioned here 
is around you know where we're from at least so i'm sure around nashville it was more talked about but um what were some of the things that stood out to you like that what that vincent would bring up whether it would be with gilliam or with robert gaddy or any of those guys what's some of the stuff that you like okay maybe this has some validity to it yeah i mean i think the biggest thing for me was this whole question about the gun sale right uh Adrian Gilliam claims that he sold Jenny Kazemi a gun in the parking lot of a Dave and Buster's, the Dave and Buster's where she worked as a waitress. And, you know, I, you know, Vincent found that hard to believe. And, you know, this, it got interesting when, you know, I reached out to the police and asked if they had, you know, surveillance footage of the, of the gun sale. And, and they said, no, they didn't. And then when I sat down with them, I asked them about the surveillance footage and they said, well, the cameras were panning, so they don't think it, it picked up anything. So, you know, there seems to be no hard evidence that this took place, this gun sale took place, other than what Adrian Gilliam said. And it also appears, you know, as we point out in the podcast, it appears he may have been, well, I mean, there, he admits one time that he was untruthful to the police, and then it appears that he may have been untruthful about his alibi, too, um, as his, his friend Tony Smith kind of, uh, you know, Tore him apart, says right? during his police interview. Yeah. So, you know, I think this the whole thing about the gun sale, just because, that's the crux of this whole thing, right? If the gun was Adrian Gilliam's, uh, you know, for Jenny Pizzani to have been the shooter at some point, she would have had to come into possession of the gun or, you know, whatever. And it seems like there's a question about, you know, how that all went down. And so to me, you know, I think Vincent would say the same thing. I mean, he mentioned that in the last episode about, you know, repeating the thing about, you know, if there's no evidence of this gun sale, then, you know, what happened. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest thing that stood out to me as far as the question Vincent raised. Now with the Nashville police department, um, you know, they finally sat down and gave you 30 minutes and it was a, a monitored almost, um, you know, very, very hard 30 minutes for you is kind of what it sounded like. Uh, yeah. Do, do you think that, their reluctance is because they've been questioned about it so much or what was the feeling that you got from them as to what their anxieties were about the situation? Have they just been beat down with those questions from maybe Vincent or other people so much, or what is that you think? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think they, they think they got it right. And, right. um, you know, they think, you know, they, as we laid out on the podcast, you know, they think Vincent's got nothing but speculation and innuendo and, right you know, that he doesn't have any hard evidence, um, which, you know, they have a point, um, as we kind of point out, he doesn't have evidence supporting some other, you know, sequence of events. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it does, I mean, as we talked about in episode eight, um, you know, I think Vincent does make good points, um, as far as poking holes in the police narrative. Um, you know, it's, and then, you know, to answer your question, they, I think they're, you know, exhausted. I think they're frustrated. I think they're, you know, they, they, uh, they clearly are tired of having to answer these same questions because Vincent's been bringing up some of these questions for years. Um, and you know, they, they told me as much, you know, when we were setting up the interview, right. That they, uh, you know, they, they, they think that they've answered all these questions and that, you know, the, the, the exercise was a, was a waste of time. Um, but you know, uh, as, you know, as I laid out on the podcast, you know, clearly Vincent does raise some valid questions. Yeah. Um, now whether or not, you know, the whole question then becomes, does he have proof of who else did it? Maybe that not necessarily, he doesn't have hard proof pointing to someone else, but he does raise some valid questions. That that's where he loses some steam is when he really doesn't have anywhere other than Gilliam and his uh, alibi not really matching, you know what the what the original story was. But then there's also to me um, the gun residue the, the or lack thereof on Jenny's hand. Then there's um, you know Wayne Neely and Gaddy when they when they find him in the time lapse before the cops are actually called. And there's all the stuff that's missing from Steve the jewelry the money. I mean, some of that stuff's got to come into question eventually, you would think, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, we, we, raised, we raised those questions, and, yeah. you know, I guess uh, the police, I mean, you know, the, the, you know I, I asked the police those questions, and, you know, they dismissed them or, you know, whatever. Um, 
as we as we discussed around that episode. I mean, you know, we can have those questions, but you know, unless the case gets reopened, unless you know, a new investigative team comes in, uh, they may just remain unresolved, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we kind of I discussed that in the last episode that unless there's some new information that comes out or someone who connects some of these dots or, you know, the police are under, you know, I mean, Vincent tried twice to go to the DA's office to get the case reopened and, and he was denied twice. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's going to remain, the case is going to remain closed and, you know, unless something happens, right. Unless someone comes forward uh, with new information, unless there's a new break in the case, unless, you know, something significant happens. Yeah, you know, and also the narrative of uh, Sahel's original, a bunch of Sahel's original friends, you were saying, you know, she was just a little sweet, petite, uh, easygoing thing. They really miss a lot of the backstory. She's she's not quite the angel that she seemed to a lot of her friends. She seems like she kind of had a double, maybe not a double life, but, you know, had had a side to her that most people just didn't know. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think she's complicated too. Yeah. Um, and you know, and you know, after you know that, and you know, when I found that, you know, I went looking for the records of Jenny's, you know, history growing up in Florida. Yeah. And when I found the records that showed that she had, uh, you know, allegedly uh, attempted suicide before, and that she was involved in a domestic violence uh, incident with her sister, and you know, when I first saw that, you know, that was the first moment. It, or one of the first moments where I was like, oh, wow, she, maybe she did do it. Maybe the right. uh, national police got it right. And, you know, those are just serious things, right? You know, mm -hmm. that evidence that she had apparently tried to commit suicide before. This is, you know, a few years before she ended up allegedly killing Steve and killing herself. And, you know, her friends have been telling me that she was nonviolent. She didn't like blood. And then there's this incident where she's striking her sister with a hairbrush. Right. Um, and, you know, that's not the same thing as, as killing someone, but you know, it, it's, it's certainly some history of violence when her friends and had told me, you know, that she wasn't a violent person. So, you know, yeah, when I uncovered those documents, it was definitely, you know, that was definitely a, a shock, a shock to me. So through all, you know, all your research from spring of 2017 here to December, 2018, what is, um, where are you at now in this case? I mean, you know, we've, we've wrapped up the podcast. And, uh, so where are you at? Where are you at mentally with this thing now? All, through all your learnings? You mean, uh, you mean, what, what, what do I think now? Or, uh, what, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, just, just, did you learn, what all did you, did you learn new about the case? And what's your overall, you know, I know in the last show you said that you, you still don't know who done it, you, you know, or whatever, but, you know, yeah. how, how, how do you feel overall about the, about the whole situation the whole case and the podcast how, how it turned out yeah I, you know i think i think what you know i think we uh i think my takeaway was you know there, it's still it still feels very much alive and there's still a lot of questions out there and you know as i said in the final episode that you know i think there should be uh there should be a new impartial investigative team to go in there and, and take a look at some of these questions that we raised some of those questions that you mentioned about you know these family members wondering if he had been robbed and you know, whether there are items taken from the condo, you know, there's just so many questions like that, that people close to Steve had that, you know, and it's unclear whether, you know, those questions were thoroughly investigated. Um, you know, especially people say, because the investigation closed after just four days. So, you know, I, I think what I learned, you know, what I'm, I'm proud of is that we, you know, over the course of nine episodes, we laid out for you, all the questions that, you know, a lot of Steve's friends and family have, a lot of Jenny's friends and family have about the case and gave you a comprehensive kind of guide to, you know, the, the places and the people and, you know, everything involved with the case and what the questions were. And, and, uh, you know, at the end of it, you know, like I said, I don't know if there's one takeaway other than, you know, something feels off here and that mm -hmm. maybe it should be re-looked re at. Have, uh, has anybody reached out to you since the podcast has come out um, that knows any more about it that now that they've heard the the whole thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, we mentioned in the last episode, 
the few people I spoke to mm-hmm. with some information about Wayne Neely and, and Doug Crow, the Nashville restaurateur, and, uh, and you know, the, the Vanderbilt player who Jenny uh, was seeing. And, you know, it, it, it's just been minor stuff here and there. And it was interesting. Those people, uh, I reached out, you know, they started reaching out to Vincent Hill, and I talked to them. That was pretty early in the podcast. So, you know, once word got out there, and, you know, it was just interesting to hear them talk about some of these people who were tangential to the podcast before we had even mentioned them on the podcast. Um, you know, it's not like they heard them on the podcast and, and then, uh, and then decided to call in. They, they were telling stuff that, you know, it seemed, uh, you know, it, it seemed like, you know, they, they, you know, they, these interactions, they, they were saying, you know, whatever the guy who, uh, uh, saw Wayne Neely at the, at the, uh, car de- detail detailing Wayne Neely's car and he gets a tip from him. Um, so yeah, there was a few of those things here and there, but it wasn't an overwhelming, you know, we didn't have a landslide of new, new leads. Um, right. you know, the stuff that, that we got, we kind of put there in the podcast. Um, uh, well, I, you know, I just want to thank you guys for putting it out there. I think, uh, I, I think it was very thorough and a lot of new information that, you know, obviously I had, I had never heard before. And a lot of our listeners have been, um, Jumping you know, over and listening to it. Yeah, I mean, we we've uh, you know whatever following we do have here, we we led let, let them your way. I mean, of course, your Sports Illustrated, you didn't need any help from us, but uh, but for sure, I know a lot of people were commenting on our Facebook and Twitter posts that were looking forward to tonight's interview, and they really enjoyed it and had a uh, had their own opinions on it. So, you know, we'd like to thank you. Um, we'll uh, we'll uh, keep plugging it for you and have everybody go back and listen. Hasn't listened to it, so. Uh, What's next for you? What do you have coming up um, lately? We, we can uh, we can be looking forward to in the future. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, it's uh, NFL playoffs are right around the corner, so I've got a bunch of uh, uh, NFL playoff stories I'm working on now. And you know, it, it, I, it, my job title is football writer, so mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to go write about some uh, uh, you know playoff stuff and uh, and write about football now for a little bit. And uh, after that, uh, we'll see. Um, I'd like to do some more investigative work in the future, maybe more true crime stories. I don't know, but you know, that's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that another day. Yeah. Well, I hope you do. Cause that was a, that was a fantastic one. I mean, it, uh, you know, true, true stories when you ever, you can build, uh, you know, build the characters and, you know, really get you dragged in. It was, so, it was just so good. You know, it just, um, binging it was, it was one of those things like you're watching on Netflix and I get accused of that from Dustin quite a bit, but you know, it's like being on Netflix. It just drags you in. You cannot wait to listen to the next one. So it, it was so good. And I hope you get to do that again. Um, thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you for putting out the podcast. Thanks for sports illustrated to, for putting you on that. Um, what's your, uh, social media so everybody can follow you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you guys want to follow along, I'm on Twitter at, at Tim Rohan, uh, it's Tim R O H A N. And uh, again, guys, I appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. Dustin following along every week, and Lucas bin- binge listening. Uh, <laughs> and no matter how you consume it, you know, I hope it's uh, I hope it was enjoyable. And thanks for having me on, guys. And thanks for listening. And I appreciate your support of the podcast. Now, I hope you're covering the Tennessee Titans here in a few weeks when those playoffs start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're in the hunt. They're so in the we'll, hunt. We'll see, but. Uh, yeah. All okay. Right. Thanks again. All right. Great interview there by Tim. Very gracious for him to join uh, join us for thirty minutes tonight, or a little bit over there. And um, I was really intrigued by this whole podcast, as much of our listeners are. Yeah, he he done a great job with it too. It was like I was saying to him, you know, it was it really draws you in. You know, he done. I hate to say character development. You know, that's what kind of got me stuttered up there. But that's that is what it is. You know, that's the players yeah. in the players in the game. You know. So, you know, the character development that he went through and the the way he laid it out, you know, it's very intriguing. It's, you know, you get, you get so many different sides to the story. Um, so many people still have questions. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if it'll ever be reopened after listening, after listening to it, you know, the Nashville police, you know, I, I, just from, you know, kind of the way, way he was laying it out in the podcast, I've, I don't know if it's so much that they're, you know, protecting someone or if, you know, they're protecting themselves. You know, they, uh, they, it very well could just be that they think that they covered all their bases because, you know, whenever he was talking to them, they had heard 
all of the things that he had brought up to him. Right. You know, so it, it it seems like they, you know, people don't want them to have heard this part or that part or that part and it'd be something new to them, but it kind of seemed like they'd heard it already. Yeah, but something just don't add up to me. Something still. does it somewhere. <laughs> it's, it really, it really doesn't. It doesn't add up and people can say whatever they want to about Vincent Hill. I'm telling you what, when he come on this show, he had me convinced. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, at the very least, he brings up enough stuff, enough questions that, you know, that doesn't seem like they were answered that I really, I just really want some, somebody officially to reopen the case to at least, or, or, you know, maybe not reopen the case, but at least give us that evidence, at least let Vincent see that evidence that he's asking for so that, you know, he can tell us. He can tell us. Yeah, uh, it doesn't make sense. There's there's too many things, like like I just brought right. up to Tim. Uh, McNair, was he robbed when he had all right. that money taken out of the bank, but then he was he was there with $7. Yeah. And I get it. He was giving her 2000 And the safe for, wasn't there. And Yeah, the safe. Then there's, um, I mean, Gotti owed him this much money. Then mm-hmm. like the, the, the time lapse when, when Neely walked in, then he called Gotti. Gaddy, and then there's the, the time lapse, and then the video surveillance of the apartment is broken up in different times. There's yeah. the times missing in the. I don't just so much stuff doesn't make sense, and the police surveillance from um, Dave and Buster's. You know, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a conspiracy theorist. You know, maybe everybody, everybody's saying that Vincent is doing this, doing that, but he really sold me on some interesting stuff, and I know you still think that Kazemi done it. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I'm I'm not. I think that there's a lot of questions there, but I would, I think it would be interesting or, you know, I don't, I don't know where the evidence is that she didn't do it, Yeah, you know, other than conjecture and theories, I, I don't see the evidence that she didn't do it. And the Nashville police department is fairly confident that they did a good job and she did. So, uh, you know, they, they're confident in their evidence, so I, I would just, I, to me, it's evidence right at this point. I just don't see how you determine it in four days with yeah, that all is this hard. That's with all this hard. other information. And another thing, I don't buy the thing that well, she was dating other guys, so she don't care that Steve was dating other women. Right. How many people do you know that that can have two or three girlfriends or two or three boyfriends, but you find out your significant other's doing it, and you you flip your switch, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Just because she was dating other men don't don't mean she wanted Steve. To not be <laughs> right. dating other women, right? And um, so, th- but you know, she knew he was married too. But well, yeah, I mean, and, yeah. they, and they, there's that. So, but she did say that um, he said that she was going to, or they were going to get a divorce. You know, they was working towards a divorce, and you know, they were very public with their relationship and so on and so forth. So, you know, she very well may have thought that. You know, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think there's, you know, I, well, I, I'll sit here and say that I still think that Sahel killed him. Mm-hmm. After after listening to all of it, I think that Sahel killed him. But I am open to the possibility that that's not the case. Right. Well, you know, and I just, you know, Tim, like you said, I love play on words there, or not play on words, but the verbiage you used there was the character development. I thought yeah. it's very good. That's what he did the best at. He laid yeah. out all these oh, names because yeah. I've got this list of names that wrote, wrote down here in front of me mm-hmm. that he did an excellent job of excellent of job. me trying to picture of these people yeah and i even googled it one night i was just i was starting oh i up. had i had a picture of every one of these yeah. people in my head yeah. you know so he did an excellent job of that and, and once again vincent hill a lot of people can say vincent's this or that but he's uh he's I, a friend of the show we'll uh, have him back on here well, pretty soon, at this point i just don't think like you said vincent hill's not in it for money uh, the, he can't be he can't you know? be the damn the, book made no money he said yeah so, that's right i mean after I after talking to him and him telling us how much he actually made and then like i was telling tim you know how many doors have been closed in his face but yet he continues on yeah i mean you know he's he's a soldier for this cause <laughs> and it's you know it, it, it's not financially based anymore i, I don't think, think so i yeah. i think because it would be so much i'm sure his uh his career would be so much smoother if he would drop it and go on to something else. Absolutely, I'm yeah. sure. So, uh, I, but I like I look uh, look forward to talking to him yeah, once again about yeah. it in the future. So, but anyway, that, uh, we'll wrap it up on this episode. And uh, if we got any new listeners out there, we appreciate you listening. If you liked it, go ahead and subscribe to us. Uh, listen to us week to week. Um, we we don't get into this stuff all the time, but when we do, we really enjoy it. Uh, most of the time, it's sports and uh, country music, but and just. Uh, Actually, general nonsense sometimes <laughs> nonsense that's, <laughs> yeah. that's 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 our better shows uh, uh lucas you heard the plug earlier you can follow us everywhere uh, at olr podcast 
Um, Lucas doesn't do social media. Nope. I'm on Twitter at DRE Kennedy underscore 83 and on Instagram as DRE Kennedy 83 and uh, run the all the OLR social media pages. So look us up and uh, you know, hope we get some new listeners. But uh, thanks again to Tim for joining us and really enjoyed talking to him. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening.